Uh, will you please call the roll? Here. 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 Okay, we have public comment on anything not on the agenda. Do you have any? I haven't received any slips. Okay, anybody? Guess not. So then we'll go right to the work session. Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Uh, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council, I was thinking about this today. This is the first time I can remember um, that we have adopted a budget and then two months later basically mm -hmm. we're back talking about that budget we just adopted. Um, so this is unusual. I think when we adopted the budget, we told you that we thought, based on some of the data that we had received really in May and June, that we, we felt that our revenue estimates were going to have to be revised. And so mm -hmm. our purpose today um, is to go over first um, fiscal year 2009, and we did this I think it was a week ago, but talked to you a little more about how we ended last year. Um, we're also going to give you a historical perspective on revenue so you can really see, um, I think, what the, the historical um, issues that we're facing and unprecedented issues with some of our revenues because it really is amazing what we've seen happen in the last nine months. Uh, then we're going to talk about the current year and that's the primary focus today is the current year and the balancing approach that we've come up with and I think you'll be pleased that we believe that we can cobble together a solution for this year. Um, and then our intention is, is, is to go through those in, in, in a fair amount of detail um, and get some kind of consensus from the council that you think we're on the right track. Some of these things we can do administratively. Other things we're going to have to come back to you with follow-up items. Um, and then the idea is that next week on Tuesday we will talk about our initial estimates for fiscal year 2011. Uh, we had scheduled initially three workshops. At this point, I don't see a need for the third workshop. I think we can cover today what we need to cover, and then on Tuesday we can cover what we need to cover. I'll leave it up to you after today if you want to give me, if you think we need the third workshop. But at this point, from a staff standpoint, we think we can do it in the two. We had reserved that time uh, just in case, but now based upon our analysis, I think we can do it in two workshops. Okay. So that's the intention today. What, in terms of who's going to talk, Bob Samario is going to go over uh, the general fund revenue historical uh, last year um, our, uh, and then a little bit about our problem for this year and then I'll go over the balancing approach and the recommended approach for the shortfalls. Okay. So, Bob. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of Council. Um, it's interesting that we're here in September because it was this time last year is when we started to really see the signs of an economic downturn. Um, you may recall that back in September we got our, our sales tax data for the quarter ended June 30, 2008, which indicated that we were down 7.4%. Um, and then shortly thereafter our, for our TOT, we saw that September TOT had gone down 1.8%, even though we had the previous month an increase of 10.6%. So it's uh, we started to see the signs then. We didn't have any idea that it would become what it is today. Um, we we actually have data in our financial management system that goes back to 1991, and um, we've been tracking these revenues since then. It's been 18, 19 years, and we've not seen anything close to what we've seen in the last six months or even the last a year. Or so, um, what we wanted to do, as Jim indicated, is to give you a more of a historical perspective as we're, what's happened in the last six months, nine months. Um, you'll see that's pretty interesting to see what's happened in the last 14, 15 years in terms of our key revenues. Excuse me, Bob. Could you speak up just a little bit? Sure. It's hard to hear you. Thank you. I'm not sure. Is this mic on? I guess. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll take a little stroll down memory lane. We're going to start with sales taxes. We're going to look over the last 14 years. What's amazing is that you can see that from 1997 to 2002, our sales taxes grew 6.1 percent on average, and that was a pretty phenomenal period of time. That was during the the, the dot com bubble and you know, all the growth in the internet-based companies. Um, we had been we were just recovering from the recession of the mid or early 90s, so it was a good time for all. Um, and then you can see that in 2002, we had a decline of 4.1 percent. We actually started seeing the slowdown in the economy sometime around January 2001. Um, the Fed started lowering interest rates substantially over a nine-month period, but it was really 9-11, the, the attacks on, in New York City, that impacted, had a great impact on the recession. Uh, but you can see that 
the very next year, um, in 2003, it came right back up 4%, and then since then, we've had a more moderate growth, but still pretty good growth, an average of 3.3%. So over a 15-year period, um, a great growth from in over a five or six-year period initially, and then a more moderate growth, but still very positive. And then 2009 hit us, and we, and we are now, um, based on our preliminary results, almost final results, we are expected to be down 10.6% last year. And then this year, 2010, we're assuming a 3.5% decline. So you can just see the dramatic change in, in, over the last 14 years. What's interesting is you can see that we've essentially will have lost, by the end of this year, if our projections hold true, we would have lost 10 years of growth in just that one revenue. The same story where our TLT revenues or bed tax revenues, even greater growth between 1997 and 2002, 9% average growth. The impacts of 9-11, a 3% decline in 2004 was relatively flat, but then we got back to normal growth, not quite as high of 9.9%, but averaging 6.2%. Still very strong growth over that period of time through 2008. In 2009, we experienced a decline of 6.5%, and for this year, our revised estimates indicate a 3.5% decline. Not as bad as sales taxes, but we have lost about five years of growth in our bed taxes um, in the last five years. Property tax revenues over the last 14 years, I'll explain the, the green sliver of the bar there in 2005, but essentially between 97 and 2005, we had a 10.6% average growth. You know, I thought we had some pretty good growth in the last five years, but you know, a while ago we were averaging over 10%, pretty phenomenal growth. We had what was called the VLF, or Vehicle License Fee Swap. That's when the state um, started paying us in lieu of vehicle license fees property taxes. And for us, actually, was a, it was a good, it helped us because VLF was a very volatile revenue. Vehicle license fees were very volatile, and property taxes is a lot more stable, and you can see it growing at higher rates. Um, but it did pump up our overall base substantially starting in 2005. Since that time, we've enjoyed 8.5% growth through 2009. And based on the estimates we've gotten for the county, we are now projecting for this year just under 1% growth. Uh, it's not a decline, but still, compared to the growth of the last 14 years, a pretty, pretty substantial outcome. So just a quick summary, since 97, we have enjoyed substantial growth in our key tax revenues. Uh, the declines in 2009 and 2010 are really unprecedented, as Mr. Armstrong indicated. But you know, there's still some uncertainty uh, over the next year, two years, as to what's going to happen with the economy. Is it going to recover the next year? If it does, to what degree? Uh, and it's going to be interesting, at least for me, to see what kind of growth rates we're going to see in the next one to two years, how it compares to the last seven years. And of course, I, I don't anticipate we're going to see the kinds of growth we saw from 97 to 2003. So this is a bit of a review. Fiscal 2009, we, we were with council or to council back on August 25th. We, we gave you our preliminary results for fiscal year 2009, and I just wanted to re recap that. You can see that um, our sales taxes, our key four top revenue sources, sales taxes, bed tax, property tax, and utility users tax are indicated there. We first show the adopted budget and our budgeted growth. For sales tax, we budgeted a modest 1% growth. And then at mid-year, based on information we had received, through essentially September, the September quarter ended, uh, we lowered our estimates and revised them down to $18.9 million, which represented a decline of 6.7%, which we thought was pretty dramatic. And that resulted in a projected variance at that time of over $1.5 million. Our bed tax, uh, we had assumed a 3% growth in the adopted budget last year. We revised that at mid-year down 1.2% 1, 1 decline, which lost us almost $550,000. Property taxes, um, we get information from the county. We, we were assuming a 5% growth. We lowered it just to 4.3, primarily because we weren't sure of the supplemental property taxes or assessments that come in throughout the year. So we wanted to be a little more conservative. We lowered it to 4.3, but still a positive growth. That resulted in a decline of 141000 And then lastly, our utility users tax. We estimated 3% growth. And actually, based on what we had through approximately December, uh, it indicated that we could actually raise our estimates, and we did so by 164000 But in total, we were looking at a variance at mid-year of almost $2.1 million. And we went over this again on the 25th, but just a quick recap. This is our balancing strategy. You can see what the elements of the projected deficit were. They totaled $6.8 million. 
Um, a big portion of that were the non-department of revenue shortfalls that I just talked about. Uh, departmental revenues, primarily parking violations and uh, community development revenues were down uh, almost $1.5 million. We had budgeted a year in variance, which is about uh, two and a quarter percent of our operating budget. We realized that we weren't going to realize that variance. Um, part of that was actually on the expenditure side. As you might recall, we used that variance to I indicate how much we might come in under budget on expenditures and over budget on revenues. We weren't expecting any variance, obviously, on the revenue side. And uh, down below, you'll see that one of our balancing strategies was to have departmental departments save money to the tune of three and a half million dollars. So that was essentially consuming that year in variance on the expenditure side. We also had some unbudgeted leave cash outs of about four hundred thousand dollars. And again, down below the, the strategy, the departments save, start to save money, and this has really started a mid-year. Uh, this wasn't an annual sort of um, target, if you were, if you will. We directed departments back in January or December to start saving, and we gave them a target of three and a half million dollars, which they, as you know now, have exceeded. We had an appropriated reserve of seven hundred thousand dollars that we could use. We use self-insurance fund reserves primarily from the workers' comp program that have been accumulated over time. Um, that's just from favorable results over the last several years. We had internal service funds chip in, $243,000. We had about a million dollars in our street sweeping fund reserves. That's from the street sweeping program. The revenues in excess of cost, particularly in the initial part of the year, initial part of the program, uh, those revenues are parking violation revenues. Uh, we used half a million of those, of that million dollars. And then we delayed a se several capital projects, the biggest being the FMS project, Financial Management Replacement Project, uh, that was about $450,000. At the end of the year, as you know, it came in even worse. Our sales taxes, based on our adjusted budget at mid-year, uh, you can see that we're down $1.2 million. The growth that we actually realized was over 10%, double digits. Our bed tax came in further, declined even further, $747,000 for a revised growth of 6.9%, decline of 6.9%. Property taxes still positive, but below what we had projected. Um, and so $71,000 is was the favorable outcome. I'm sorry, we had lowered, the, lowered it at mid-year, but it did better than we thought. So we actually did a little better there. Utility users tax came in let one point, a tenth of a percent. Um, so that was under our mark, and we, we had to, of course, lower the number by $280,000. But in total, we lost $2.2 million by the end of the year in relation just to the mid-year adjustments. I just wanted to highlight for sales taxes that when we were putting together the budget for 2009, and or at least making projections for 2009 and even 2010, we really had only two sets of data that we were using for sales tax. That was the quarter end of June 30, which is the box at the bottom. We had a 7.4% decline in that quarter. We got that information in September. And then we also saw then the September quarter come in flat. It was a slightly up. We felt a little bit better, of course, after the 7.4% decline. But those, those two bits of data, at least for sales tax, is what we, were, we had available to us in making projections for 2009. Since that time, We've seen double-digit declines in each quarter, 11.7%, 17.6%, and then our current estimate for the quarter, into June, quarter ending June 30 is 14.4% decline. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't know that number until um, a couple weeks, actually, when we get that cleanup payment uh, around September 18th. 14.4% decline represents what the state has um, projected would be the um, results for the quarter into June 30. But still, three quarters in a row where we're looking at double-digit declines. So in terms of the year-end results for 2009, revenues came in under budget, almost $4.2 million. But on the expenditure side, we actually had a favorable outcome. We saved over $4.3 million, which, which more than offset the loss in revenues. So we ended up, on, in terms of a variance, a budget variance on the positive, of $142,000. But the actual results of operations, our revenues minus our expenses or expenditures, did, did result in still a shortfall of almost $2.5 million. And as we talked about uh, with council on the 25th, the, the likely options we'll be recommending to address that are the self-insurance funds and reserves. Um, and those are backwards. Actually, the self-insurance fund reserves have about $3 million currently available. The city hall allocation fund reserves have about 
So, for, so what that mm -hmm. means is we think that we can, by utilizing those reserves, basically balance out last year without having to take any additional monies from the general fund budgetary reserves. Just so I want to make it clear. Yeah. And we think these are appropriate because they're basically general fund dollars that have accumulated in these two funds. Okay. So looking now, focusing on fiscal year 2010, uh, just wanted to show you the revenues. This is sort of a review, um, but this shows all of our revenues totaling $105 million in 2010 by object category. And mm -hmm. as you well know, taxes represents the largest slice of that pie, 64 million point two. 62% of our overall revenues. At a, in terms of the breakdown of the key tax revenues, sales tax is $18.5 million, property taxes, 23.9. And I remember when sales taxes far exceeded our property taxes, right. and it's well below it now. Our bid tax at $12 million, utility users tax is $7.2 million. Interfund charges total $16.4 million. You'll see the sort of a breakdown of the key items overhead. Those are the charges that are um, to enterprise funds from administrative departments such as finance, uh, city attorneys, city administrator's office, etc. That totals $7.2 million. Uh, it also includes the reimbursements from the airport to the fire department for the aircraft rescue and firefighting services. Again, $1.7 million. Then actually the Parks and Recreation Department does charge our this, the streets fund for maintenance of the, of the median, if you will, as part of the forestry program. And so they get reimbursed $1.3 million. And then service charges, these are amounts, these are fees for services. Um, you'll see a lot of them, of course, in the recreation program, the community development, but in total, $9.5 million, just 9% of our total revenues. So we recover less than 10% of our costs from fees and charges. Again, the largest portion comes from taxes. When we, had, when we adopted the budget and we were putting together, we had projected a deficit of $10.9 million. We had adopted a balancing strategy that included departmental adjustments. And this is net of all the adjustments that were made uh, in June when we um, restored positions and, and we added back some items. So this is the net or final numbers. Departments basically kicked in almost $6.9 million. Some of that was revenue enhancements, but the mar large majority was were cuts and expenditures. We had labor concessions totaling $1.5 million. Cost shifts to enterprise funds, particularly the waterfront fund and downtown parking of $570,000. The ICS fund rebates totaled $870,000. We actually added back money to create a, to add to our existing appropriated reserves, uh, which now total about $700,000. And then there were some reductions to community organizations totaling $150,000, and then capital project deferrals over 1.2. So looking at our revenue projections and trying to define the problem now for this current year. Our sales tax rest estimates for the adopted budget were $18.1 million. That was based on a budgeted growth of one, a decline of 1.4%. Since, since receiving information in June for the quarter ended March 31st, and based on what the state is telling us now and what the statewide estimates are, we have revised our estimates down to $17.1 million, which is a decline of $3.5 million and a, an additional deterioration of revenues of over $1 million just for that one revenue, just based on information we received in the last several months. I wanted to show you that when at mid-year when we gave you our, when we adjusted the estimates, we were using that, we were basing that on a letter we received from the state that gave us some projections and you can see the letter dated January 16th, 09. On the left, 8.7% decline for the quarter into June 30, 2008, sorry, 2009, and then a drop of 5.1%, uh, drop 2.7, and it started to get flat, and then by June 30, 2010, they were expecting an increase. In May, about four weeks, a month before we adopted the budget, um, they gave us a new letter with revised numbers, which indicate that for the quarter that ended June 30, they're expecting now a decline of 14.4%. That was the number you saw on the previous slide. For the September quarter, 11.5, so two double-digit declines in a row. And now they're seeing it recover more quickly. It's flattened just for the quarter ended December 31st, but an additional decline in March, and then a slight increase for June 30, 2010. Our bed tax, we originally adopted a budget of $12 million, which assumed a decline of 
Since then, since for the last two, three months, we've received uh, bed tax information on a monthly basis. We revised that down to 5.6% going down. That resulted in a decrease in our revenue projections of $675,000. You'll see a little asterisk there. We've included in our budget $100,000 for TLT on vacation rentals. We are implementing an audit program. We're still building that program. We haven't gotten out, got that out yet. We haven't sent out notices, but we'll be doing that within a month. We're expecting about $100,000 in revenues from that, from that audit program. And just real quickly, this is a kind of a table you've seen in the past. We, we include that in emails to you. But wanted just to indicate to you and show you that starting in September 2008, which I alluded to earlier, we started seeing the declines in our bed tax. 11 straight months of declines starting September 2008 through uh, July 2009. And seven of the last months, we've seen double-digit declines. And you don't see anything nearly that like that in, in the previous years, which are shown to the left. For 2010, uh, you know, for the first time, we've actually looked at month by, by month, what are we expecting to achieve and realize by way of growth or declines um, in 2010? We know what it is in, in July. That was an actual number, 14.6% decline. But starting in August, which we'll know about um, in just a couple of weeks, we've made assumptions. And for August, we've assumed a decline of 23.1%. And if you look to the left of that, you'll see that we had a pretty strong month last year in August. It was an increase of 10.6%, so it's a pretty high threshold for us to be dealing with. And so that's why that number is, is unusually high of a de decline of 23.1%. You can see it starts tapering off. And we're just making an assumption that as we progress through the year, things are going to moderate, that by the middle of the year, we're going to see everything kind of flat and then actually see some growth by the end of the year. Unfortunately, the first three or four months represent a large portion of our bed tax revenues. In fact, I think if you just look at do the math, the first four months or three months through September represent about 35% of our total bed tax revenues for the year. So for the year, we're, we're expecting a decline of 6.5%. And, and, I, and I, these are our, I'd say these are our best guesstimates based upon what we know, and these are you know, we hope we're being conservative, um, but we're just going to have to monitor this month by month. We we think that it got so bad in the springtime that, you know, can it get any worse, especially if you look back even two or three years, um, even though it looks like just a 0% and 1%. But, um, again, this is just our best estimate based on what we, when we talk to the hoteliers. But um, a lot of this depends on whether or not the economy just flattens out um, instead of continuing to decline. And we're not, I guess, we're not claiming we're experts in this. Uh, I, it's just this was our best estimate, and we tried to look at it month by month rather than just take the whole year because there were some anomalies last year, um, like, like in August where it went up, that we felt we needed to even be more pessimistic than we probably originally were. Question. Do you have, did you by any chance, um, and I know you're very close with all the city managers up and down the state, but um, like kind cities that we use as comps and comparables for, you know, union negotiations and various things. Have you, are these the same kinds of numbers that they're using as well? What kind of outside the bubble conversations have you had? You know, originally uh, when the, when the re recession was first starting to hit, in fact, I think I told the council this six or eight months ago, Coastal community, communities were doing better than some of the inland communities. Most recently, especially with, with bed tax, now I'm hearing these 20% type declines pretty universally. Um, I just talked with some Anaheim folks, you know, who have a large tourist business. That's the kind of what they're reporting. I just met with the city manager of Galit and city manager of CARP today, and these are the kind of numbers. Actually, the folks who have a higher concentration of luxury hotels than we do, are seeing much larger declines. Okay, so the Coronados and the um, Monterey's and Santa Cruz, or well, um, Dana Point, Carmel's and Dana Point, Laguna Carmel, Beach, Dana, yeah, that have a higher concentration of luxury are getting hit much harder. So it's not the people just aren't traveling here; they're just not traveling. Yeah, and, and I, and this is part of this is speculation. Partly, it's talking with hoteliers. I think when they tried to keep their room rates up even when the occupancy rates were dropping mm -hmm. and they got to a point where the occupancy rates started to drop so much that then they started cutting their rates and so that's why we started seeing the real significant drops yeah well we've cut our rates too here so yeah. thank you
property tax revenues. Uh, we got information from the county back in February, I think, that indicated that we would be growing next year in 2010, I'm sorry, 2010 by 3%. Um, in June, we received a letter from them saying, or an email saying that um, those estimates have been revised and they're now projecting a growth of just of under 1%. Hmm. So that change alone um, caused a drop in our revenues of over $430,000. Our utility users tax, uh, we had budgeted a growth of 2.5%. We've lowered that to 1% primarily based on the fact that uh, we've seen two sectors that go down in the last six months, uh, months electric and the natural gas. You know, natural gas is, is volatile. It can go up in one year 15%, decline the next year in by 15%. It's really a hard one to predict, but as of late, we've seen it uh, more declines because just the commodity price has gone down. So we've adjusted our projections for 2010, lowered them by just slightly from 2.5% to 1%, but that still represents a loss of $325,000. And then, as you know, we, uh, part of the federal stimulus package was to included some, some COPS grants funding. We had budgeted... Um, having four positions, sworn positions funded from that COPS grant. It was a competitive grant. Um, there was a big demand for that grant. There was about a billion dollars available and I think $8 billion of, of requests. Um, this, the, the county of Santa Barbara was essentially zeroed out. We didn't get any, any funding. And so now we're left with basically a shortfall in our revenues of that grant. It's not going to come in. There's some talk that maybe they're going to add some more money back, but that's really uncertain at this point. But for now, we're looking at a, a loss of $451,000 that was earmarked for those four sworn positions. So in total, you could see that we are now just three months into the year, really two months into the fiscal year, we are projecting a decline in revenues of about $3 million from the time we adopted our budget. So again, the, the problem that we believe we need to solve at this point is about $3 million. And so for the last Pretty much since the fiscal year began, we've been meeting the department heads, myself and the finance staff, and trying to say, okay, how are we going to deal with this problem? First, it was defining it and trying to be conservative on how we defined it, and then uh, what could we do to try and solve the problem? And so um, what I'm going to go through now is our approach to dealing with this problem. And, I, and first I want to talk about, I think, what some of our objectives were in dealing with the problem. And the first was to not use any more general fund policy reserves. And so what we're proposing to you today doesn't propose any general fund, the use of any policy reserves. It does propose some one-time monies, but not any more of the policy reserves. Second, at this point, we're trying to avoid any employee layoffs. Uh, one of the reasons for that is, is we just entered into an agreement with SEIU just a couple months ago and I think we almost felt at least at this point it might be bad faith to just turn around and then lay off people who I think they felt they had saved their jobs. I, I'm not giving you any promises that if things were to deteriorate more, you know, that we might not be back in the springtime, but at this point we're not proposing any layoffs. Okay. Um, we had the departments provide um, our office and finance a series of, a series of options. Um, but we're, we didn't use a, an across-the-board approach. Um, in some cases, we hit hard. In other cases, we didn't hit at all. Um, because as we've gotten further down into the organization, uh, this gets more difficult. And quite honestly, in some places, we were taking advantage of vacant positions that are already there, where we haven't at this point seen a major deterioration of service rather than, and part of this was to avoid layoffs. So a little of this is opportunistic, but we tried to balance it out. Um, we're trying to use savings from vacant positions this year. We're not proposing that any positions that are on this list at this point be eliminated. However, in many cases, we believe these are positions that next year we will propose that they actually be eliminated, that they would be held vacant. And of course, we're trying to minimize service level impacts on the public. And I, I think when you when you see what we're proposing, that it's a pretty balanced approach, and at least in, in and we cobble it together. But I think we get ourselves through the year, and, and we help to position ourselves for um, the the serious issues we're still going to have to deal with next fiscal year, um, because we we're not out of the woods. Um, so again. Um, as Bob went over, the, in terms of our revenue shortfall, uh, the tax shortage is about $2.5 million, 
and then the, we've, we're assuming we will not get the COPS grant, so that's the 451. And then the strategy I'm going to go over with you has um, $775,000 of one-time measures and $2.1 million of, at least at this point, I will call ongoing measures. Um, first, let me go over the one-time measures. Um, we're proposing about $200,000 more from the self-insurance fund reserves. Uh, again, we just continue to have had, we're, we've just closed out the books of this, this fiscal year, and there we are, our reserves for claims that are from the general fund and the workers' comp fund exceed our liability. And so we can move that money in, and, I, and, and we're still in good shape there. And I, it's really important to say that, and I mentioned this last week, it wasn't that long ago, four or five years ago, we were just the opposite. We were four or five million dollars underfunded in that fund, and so we made a dramatic change there as a result of a fantastic safety record, changes in state law, and much more attention, and also the modified duty program. Um, we're proposing that we transfer $200,000 from the street sweeping fund. Those are general fund monies that we just kept there. That still leaves a couple hundred thousand dollars in that fund, basically for operational ups and downs. Um, and we're proposing, you may recall, that you had about uh, $700,000 you had put in appropriated reserves. We're proposing you pull out $375,000 of those appropriated reserves, leaving an additional balance of $323,000 for future problems. So we're not, we're not recommending you pull all of that out. Can I ask the... Um the street sweeping fund, is that from the TOT? Is that? No, that's actually. It's a different one. It's a those are actually excess parking citation yeah. violation okay. fines that exceed the cost of street sweeping. Okay. And it primarily in the, in the beginning years before we expanded the program, um, now that we've expanded the program, that it's almost about revenues and expenditures out, but these had piled up over the years. Okay. But our, our, our ticket money is down. But this is just yeah, extra just over this the years. This is actually accumulated over the years. Okay. And this was a policy choice by the council to right. just put that money in that fund. It could have always gone in the general fund. So. No, I remember. Okay, thanks. I, the reason it's one time is is that we're not running a, a, a surplus on in an ongoing basis in that fund. Okay. So at some point, you'd, we got to leave a couple hundred thousand in there just for annual variations, and that's right. about where we are. Okay. In terms of ongoing measures, they total about almost two point two million dollars. Uh, we went back to our internal service funds. And you'll recall this is the fleet operation, this is the facility maintenance operation, and it's also our um, um, IS information systems. Um, it, it totals about 5% of our operations. Not all, are, not all of our funds are affected. In fact, I'm not proposing any further reductions this time with the IS uh, information services because the only way to achieve that would have been through layoffs, and I'm concerned about the level of cuts there already. So this is primarily in the motor pool and also in uh, facility maintenance. <clears throat> um, we're proposing an ongoing revenue change, and I think most of the council's aware of this. In fact, I think you asked us to look at this, and that is the electrical franchise fee surcharge with, that we've been placing in the undergrounding fund we're recommending that that go straight to the general fund. We've uh, worked with the city attorney's office. We've consulted with Edison, and we believe that we can make this shift. It probably will take some resolution from the council at some point. Uh, and this would be an ongoing change. And will that have to go through the PUC again or not? We're not quite sure if okay. it does. We think Edison has said they have no problem with it, and this was their application to the PUC. Okay. And they don't believe the PUC would have a problem with it either. Okay, good. Um, the ongoing measures include holding 12 vacant positions, vacant all year, um, and, and leaving nine vacant part, uh, part of the year. And we'll go through the details on these. So now I'm just going to go through these uh, by section. And again, um, this is not, was not pro rata across the board. You'll see some folks got hit pretty hard, others not at all, and a lot of this was trying to avoid layoffs. and. The other thing we're finding, quite honestly, in a couple of our administrative functions is there's not much more there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I say, in, like, in, for example, in finance, you know, we've got to have a couple accountants left to make sure the bills get paid and some of those kinds of things. Um, so it's going to be, it's getting more difficult in some of these areas. 
Um, in the city administrator's office, um, you recall we received a, a CalGRIP grant uh, to help in our gang efforts. As a part of that grant, we had requested some administrative money that could be used to pay for part of our special projects manager, that's Don Olson. So this was a gimme. We, had, we, we received the grant and the money was, was approved for that in the grant. Um, I recently sent you an email that um, I've shifted 50% of Christy Schmidt's time. She's the employee relations manager to Solid Waste. Uh, she will basically manage that on a day-to-day -day basis for the next year, year and a half. Um, because Bob Samario is now, you know, the interim finance director. Um, this is a, she's looked for additional challenges. I think this will work, but this is an experiment. Uh, we, we know it's an experiment. She does have some solid waste background, especially with the franchises. Um, so we'll see how that works. Uh, we're a little small. We're going to be charging water resources for some inside Santa Barbara uh, pro uh, programming. Um, and we're reducing some hourly support for special city TV programming. Okay, Doss. Well, on the on the um, inside Santa Barbara, we all yearly use usually also have inside Santa Barbara specials on Comb and CCRB, which would also probably be a water department function. Are those being calculated into the cost? Because if not, it would, we would be undercharging the water fund. I'll have to ask Rebecca, but I think yeah. we're charging water for about everything we can. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> Rebecca. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. I'm Rebecca Bjork, Water Resources Manager. Um, the, rev the support from City TV historically has been done without direct charges to us. And when we've given them requests to do pro articles or interviews for us, and they've done, as you know, an excellent job. We think that we would like to have a larger exposure to the general public about the things we do. And so we see this as a real opportunity for us to have additional coverage from City TV for water resources activities. So the Comb and CCRB articles that were recently done by City TV are something that the city does do also, so they would be the kinds of projects that we would target and make sure that we have included in all of the Inside Santa Barbara episodes okay but to be sure but to be to be certain we'll check and make sure we're charging as much as we can mm -hmm. appropriately and legally mm -hmm. in community development um, there's three recommendations there there's a we're assigning a part-time planner to uh, to creeks projects for six months this is a win-win creeks needed the support okay. um, and this allows us to save that position there it does affect uh, planning productivity and, and um, I think Paul is starting to get concerned about about planning and I think when we talk next Tuesday he'll talk to you about I think about his larger concerns for next year um, this one may not make me popular uh, with boards and commission members but we're recommending that we suspend the board and commission stipends that we have in community development um, it was just hard not to do that other than, than based upon some of the other issues we're facing there's a current records technician vacancy uh, in community development. We're recommending that, be, recommending that be held vacant for the rest of the year. Uh, there's some impact on our ability to respond to requests there, but we think we can, we can work around that. In the finance department, um, um, we're proposing to leave the assistant finance director position vacant for the remainder of this fiscal year, probably next year, but we have to watch that one very carefully. Um, and that would also, though, require that we reduce some of the, what we had already been allocating of his time to the solid waste fund. Um, there's a utility services supervisor who's in the general fund. Uh, we can move a little more of his time to the water fund. He primarily supervises the water meter readers, but some of his time was spent on the warehouse. And there's some minor mis miscellaneous line items that are left there. In the library, there are three currently vacant positions. So these positions are already vacant. Um, and we've been able to provide services at this point. This is about as far as we can go before we're going to be back to you talking about reductions of service hours. But we can maintain this at this point without reducing service hours. Um, this is one that you saw before. and. Um, 
and, and I part, much of this one on the 50 cent hold, I know that you were concerned about the juvenile materials. The problem is our system doesn't allow for us to differentiate between the juvenile material holds and all the others. And so it's actually created a lot more work for the staff to do this. They don't think it's going to have a large impact on the, you know, it's, it's still a minor charge. And if uh, Irene can address this further if you want, but we just, it, it's just created an administrative hassle that whenever it's a juvenile hold, they have to then go back in and, and manually then give them a credit. Um, and so um, we're recommending that we impose this. Parks and Recreation, $390,000. Um, there, we're recommending that we hold four currently vacant positions open for the rest of the year. That includes their business manager, that's a management position, a grounds maintenance worker one and two, and a pool maintenance tech. This will have, especially in, in park maintenance, some impacts, although they're already absorbing them. Um, if you want more details, Nancy or uh, no, Jill's here can, okay, can, can answer your questions. We're delaying some more equipment replacement, some line item savings, some hourly staff for capital projects, um, new revenue expenditure savings for some recreation programs, uh, aquatics hourly staffing a little bit, a junior counselor program. And there's currently in a, a vacant administrative specialist position um, that, we're, um, that, that we've been holding that vacant, backfilling with some hourlies. Um, a person's out on long-term leave, and we're recommending that we just not backfill with administrative hours, and there's about $60,000 of savings there. The police department was a difficult one. Um, we're recommending that we restore the lost COPS money into their budget. There's currently, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, in, in the police department, there's currently seven positions vacant, sworn positions vacant in the police department. And we expect two more to become vacant in the next two or three months. Um, we're recommending that we go forward with the next academy and send five sworn positions. The police department informs me that's about the maximum they want to send to any one academy. Um, we're recommending that we hold four hope, hope or vacant at least for the next academy. Um, but we're also recommending that over the next two or three months we evalu evaluate the feasibility of civilianizing two of the sworn positions. The yes, police yes. department mm -hmm. believes, and yes. we've got to do more of an evaluation, that by civilianizing two positions, we can save about $170,000 a year. So basically, we've got sworn folks doing duties that we think could be done by civilians, basically you get the same services and save the money. But we're not recommending any changes on that until we do a further evaluation. Okay, Dale? I have a question, too. Thank you. Jim, which two positions are you talking about, civilianizing? Uh, help me out here. I believe it's the special events coordinator and what's the other? And the training officer. Okay. Thanks. Question. Aren't those two positions uh, held by, um, I mean, what happens to the patrol aspect of those two positions going into the future, Frank? I have another question, too. Uh, council Member Falcone and uh, members of council, Frank Maddox from the uh, police department. Those two positions are currently not assigned to our patrol division. Uh, they are currently assigned to the admin services division. As such, they handle purely administrative functions, so it would have no impact on our patrol function. But let me ask you this then, when you rotate around what you do, all of the various different uh, positions except for, uh, well, even you guys switch uh, departments, if you will. Um, what I mean is captains and lieutenants. And so what happens when that, in other words, when you shift around and patrol becomes admin and admin becomes detectives or whatever, then what happens when you're down to sworn officers in that shift around? Well, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm not explaining it very well, I but you know I what understand. I'm talking about. The theory is to civilianize the two administrative positions, which essentially have no impact on our calls for service or investigative workload. 
And the theory is that by finding the right civilian, especially someone who perhaps has prior law enforcement experience, they could handle the administrative duties dealing with uh, the state of California, with the Post uh, Police Officers Standards and Training Commission, mm -hmm. uh, and work with our special events coordination um, to ensure that these administrative functions are still carried out, uh, but the net impact on our in-field enforcement is zero because mm -hmm. these positions do zero in-field enforcement presently. The only time they're in the field is during Fiesta and Fourth of July, and a loss of two sworn positions uh, during that time could be made up by backfilling it with the sheriff's deputy, which we currently do anyway with other positions. <laughs> So we feel that yeah. with a relatively minor inconvenience of um, uh, backfilling during Fiesta, which again is the only time these sworn positions are actually in the field, <laughs> that we could uh, carry out the same mission. So it would be really a net change of zero. Yeah. Great. Okay. I would need to know more about that. But um, the question that I have also is in terms of the, at, at least here it says, nine vacant. I understand seven of them are currently vacant and two are expected uh, retirements, I would assume. Uh, why are those seven vacant at the moment? And what are they? Because we have a policy of certain amount and it seems like Right. We that minus seven isn't what we asked for. We are currently authorized under our present budget for 140 sworn positions. The September Academy was canceled by the Ventura right, uh, Sheriff's Department, uh, and their next projected Academy date is January. So we've had these seven positions vacant since the beginning of the fiscal year, so we have realized salary savings on those seven positions for the whole for the whole year or for the whole portion of the year, mm -hmm. uh, which will continue until January. Mm -hmm. So seven positions at one hundred and twelve thousand dollars a position um, for half a year is about three hundred ninety thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Okay, and that's the next academy coming up, and it was canceled for no fault of ours in particular. It was canceled because many departments, including the local regional departments, uh, were experiencing cuts and had to cut back on the number of people they could send to the academy. Right. We didn't experience any cuts in our sworn strength, so we have always been waiting to send people to the next available academy, which at this time will now be January. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, Dale? Captain Mannix, one other question. Um, so I just want to be clear about this. Right now we have two sworn officers who are serving in, this, in these roles, training and special events. That is correct. Is that their full-time duty? Yes. So what happens to them after we civilianize these positions? They would uh, transfer back to the patrol division. Okay, good. So that the, again, the net uh, change in patrol staffing would be zero. We would then back hire two police technicians, which are non-sworn positions, to carry out that function. But the police technician is about $160,000 a year, where a police officer is about, starting police officer, salary and benefits, $112,000 a year. So th this is why we're going to experience about $173,000 general fund savings in an ongoing ongoing. Sure. Way. No, I understand that. But when you, when you say there's zero effect on the patrol force. That's correct. Isn't there a real effect in that these officers can't possibly actually be on patrol now, but they will possibly be once this happens? No, because uh, the overall staffing in our team strength, which is currently scheduled at 57 officers divided among our, our six teams, would remain at 57. Mm -hmm. You see, so we're not taking, we're losing two police officer positions, but they're not coming out of patrol team strength. They're coming out of administrative positions, and then we're backfilling them with non sworn administrative positions. Okay, so where will the two officers go, the two sworns? What will they be doing after this happens? Well, primarily patrol. However, they could go to another specialty assignment somewhere mm -hmm. else in the department. They could simply say, well, since I'm no longer going to be working in training and recruitment, uh, I will see if I can become a detective or become a motor officer or, or become a patrol officer. It's a little bit up to their choice to compete for those positions. Okay. So I can't say with certainty where they'll go, okay. but the likelihood is they'll, they'll go to patrol. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, Das. 
So I what if the next academy is scheduled for January? When is the the one after that likely to be unknown, undetermined? Yeah. So just typically, do, does typically it happen every about four every months? Three or? to four months. Okay. So five is the maximum you'd want to send to an academy, just because if you did more, you wouldn't be. Um, they might the the sixth or the seventh might not be of the same quality as the first five. Is that why? I can't say um, adamantly that we, you know, we couldn't send eight or nine. Um, it's difficult to send a class that large because uh, the pool from which you draw is only so big. Uh, to send eight or nine, it means we have to probably put 30 people in background. Uh, to uh, we just get a, an attrition and washout rate and background of that rate. Um, typically, our academy classes are about five. We have had them as big as, as nine, and I can tell you I was the commander in charge of, of the uh, division when we did that, uh, and it was a real, real effort to get nine people into the academy. So gener because we're seven short right now of our sworn strength, how much is that savings for half a year? Because, you know, we wouldn't, unless we get lateral transfers, we're not going to have those for half a year. Right. With the, the two additional, so with the nine, it's four hundred and fifty one thousand dollars for a half year savings. Four hundred and fifty one thousand. Yes. For a half year's savings. Yes. With the, with all those positions. So we almost get to five hundred thousand even if we we fully hired for the January right. um the the January uh, um Yes. Uh, and okay. then we also had the additional misfortune of, of not getting the COPS funded positions of about a $500,000 loss. So it, um, the 500000 that we're saving by holding these positions vacant also helps mitigate that loss. Mm -hmm. Are we trying to reach 500000 or are we trying to reach 500000 plus the four hundred and fifty from COPS? For this proposal, it's 500000 Okay. But, but I think uh, just so you understand my, I guess, thought process in, in doing this is I think you're going to get 500000 in salary savings either way. I think what, what we're trying to do is the police department said five is about right. Patrol strength is pretty good right now because of the lack of folks out on, on, on injury. And I wanted to basically give some flexibility for the future to, one, look at this issue about civilianizing a couple spots. And also, quite honestly, if our financial situation deteriorates, to keep options open for the future. Because I think we've, we've got to be realistic. If we go all the way back up to 140 and we don't have a lot of movement then, will you hurt some of your flexibility in the spring and the next fiscal year? Okay. I, but I just still wanted to get the clarity that we, we could conceivably hit this $500,000 target while still going back to full sworn strength of 140 officers. Approximately, Okay, yes. that's really important. Okay, Helene. I want to follow up on the civilian and what happens to the two sworn. So let's say, let's say this analysis occurred and in January, I don't know, you make your determination if, we, if this will work, the two people who are currently sworn would basically, would they cover two of the nine vacant positions? So, yes, yeah, something yeah. like okay. that. Okay. So that would mean if, if this were to happen, those two currently current sworn officers doing administrative function move over to the two of the nine vacant positions on, on for other sworn position other sworn duties. We add another five to the academy which leads two left in, in terms of other vacancies. So then the quest so if we wanted to get to full force right away in January we would look at a potential of seven in, if, if we wanted to change, you know, change that into seven in January, holding the option open of the, civili the civilian, um, civilianizing the other two positions. So that's, that's is that exactly an accurate how it, statement? It could work. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do I have another question? Okay. Ms. Falcone? Um, the operative word in the sentence being could. Um, so if DOS is correct and we could get up to the 500,000 savings while sending seven or nine uh, into the academy, uh, which I understand is difficult because of the pool from which you draw and then you 
how many applications did we get last time? We got close to 900 submitted online. Yeah. However, we had a typical number show up for the actual yeah. testing. It's very easy to apply now because people just go online and fill out an application, and they do so up and down the state of California. But the actual numbers who turned out, kind uh -huh. of the old-fashioned way, you got to show up to test, <laughs> um, it was a, a typical crowd of about 300. 300. So seven or nine out of 300, 30 qualified to do back or 30 that come out of background in a qualified way. Is, is that uh, pretty standard? What typically happens is you lose 50% of your applicants during the written examination. So three. We did that in law up. school too. Yeah. Right. So then you'll be left with 150. The right. remainder go through a physical agility test. Uh, the vast majority pass. Uh, the remainder go through an oral background. Maybe 30, 40 percent will fail the oral, uh, and then you're left with a, a qualification list. And that list is you know, typically around 100. Now, that ranges from people who are very excellently qualified to people who just marginally passed every, every test we offered. And then we try to look at the, the people at the very top bands uh, and then consider other considerations such as bilingual abilities and things of that nature and try to pick the best of the best. Typically, even though they appear best of the best during the selection process, uh, they'll still be disqualified in background. So that's why to get about nine people into an academy, we have to put about 30 into background. Mm -hmm. And they'll be disqualified for criminal reasons, drug reasons, uh, personal yes. relationship reasons, things, things of that nature. Right, sure. I, I guess I, I just don't want to be, again, penny wise and pound foolish in cutting the police department too short for speculative and possibly, you know, reasons that may or may not occur. That to qualify the number that we need, if we can get the high caliber of people we deserve and expect and, and, and go for, um, I think that that may be the wiser course of action at this point uh, as opposed to just qualifying a number that happens to fit budget, uh, budget constraints at this point. So I'm not quite sure if uh, being cutting off our nose to spite our face or being penny wise or pound foolish is the appropriate way to go in that um, I personally, and I don't know about uh, anybody else up here, but uh, I would like to see no cuts in public safety and a restoration of the full force that we enunciated two years ago. I see no reason for why we need to cut this when there are, are still some other places that could make, uh, make up the money, and if DOS is correct, that we can actually get there uh, while achieving both, we could achieve both goals, I guess, is, is my point. So I'm, I'm very skeptical about this particular approach, and those are, those are the reasons why. We have been indeed fortunate that we started the fiscal year with these vacancies in place because they've allowed us to now put those savings towards this, this pending problem. And then, of course, as we fill up all our vacancies, we, we lose that option. So that's um, yes, you know. but Deputy Chief, the community gets the coverage that they deserve and expect, and that's the more important goal here. And we can find the money. Thanks. Well, Madam Mayor. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Um, Deputy Chief Mannix. So just a, one of the questions I've had, and I should have asked it before now, but um, we we talk about the sworn the size of the, of the force from in terms of sworn officers, but how large is the organization as a whole? 206, I believe. Okay, mm -hmm. and so I guess my question goes, and without having um, anything really to rely on one way or another, to what degree do the, does this strategy affect uh, the support services for the officer, the sworn officers? I mean, is there an impact on them in terms of uh, any changes that we're making here that would make uh, their time in the field reduced or any other, I mean, how does, how do the, how does this affect them in that way? We currently have three vacancies uh, either open or projected to be open in the non-sworn rank. Uh, those vacancies are a assistant ID technician who would work in the crime lab. Uh, that gentleman uh, left our department at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, we have a um, uh, detective secretary who is uh, has announced her retirement mm -hmm. and then lastly we have a crime analyst who has requested to vacate that position and move over to the records bureau so this person is now staffing a position which was vacant in the records bureau and we have not filled the crime analyst position 
so we're realizing, um, I don't have the number before me, but mm -hmm. it's significant salary savings in those positions as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess my question goes to its impact on the um, on what the public probably sees more, which is the uh, officers in the field or the, 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 the response time or any other things that would be um, service impacts of any of these decisions we're making, um, or perhaps uh, uh, requests for investigation or, um, um, investigations of, uh, of property that's been confiscated, those kinds of things. Is there, what kind of service impacts do we expect from those kinds of changes? We, we have diminished our non-sworn ranks as, as part of our efforts to make budget for fiscal year 10. And some of that workload has been shifted to the sworn rank. There is just no other way to get around it. I speak about the workload from the range master. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have to run the cars down to public works to get serviced, and sometimes we have police officers do that, where typically the non-sworn would do it. It's, um, it's a headache, but we get the job done, because that's, that's the mission that we have to accomplish. So um, when you talk about reductions in non-sworn strength, uh, typically, that workload just has to be picked up with existing staff because it wasn't superfluous to begin with. And in some cases, that is non-sworn. Typically, and, and we try to prioritize things so that workload matches pay grade and matches what we hire people to do, uh, we try to shift that workload towards other non-sworn members. But that's not always the practical. Okay. Well, I think, uh, and we've got a lot more to go through here today, but that's one of the things I'll be interested in hearing as, as we, you know, deal with this. Uh, I guess it's not just from your department, from all the departments, because we're now, I think, getting to the point where we're going to begin to have a public that feels the changes that we're making, whereas up to now we've been able to fairly well insulate the public from the, 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 the changes that we've had to make to accommodate all these things. And uh, this may be one area that we're going to start, start feeling it. But I, I really appreciate having a... Um, a um, a clear understanding of what these changes will be. What the, I think the public needs to have an understanding too of what these changes that we're doing here this year will mean to them in terms of what their expectations are for service and uh, for what happens. So, um, it does, it does, could, would it be fair in saying that what we're proposing here does not have a dramatic impact on service in terms of response to Part One crimes or something that are underway or? Or is it something we need to take into consideration and feel that these changes may very well have that kind of an impact? Our strategy from the beginning was to preserve field strength, mm -hmm. and that's still our, our strategy. Okay. Uh, we still have uh, what I consider to be nice to have functions, such as DARE, our PAL program, our B coordinator programs. We still have those programs funded to the extent that they are. Um, and I'm not proposing the elimination of those programs, even with these changes. Okay. However, as our team strength starts to fall, we would consider pulling from those specialty positions and backfilling team strength. Okay. I, I just spent four and a half years as the patrol commander, and I can tell you that as we approach 45 officers in field strength, it becomes difficult. Sure. Uh, sometimes I got down as low as 38 uh, a few years ago. Yeah. It was extremely difficult. Typically, we're between the uh, 43 to 45 range, uh, and right now we're at 50. So we're doing okay right now. Um, and that is because our patrol schedule is designed to accommodate normal fluctuations in workload and staffing. And it is a normal set of circumstances for us to have three or four officers in training at any given time, and then three or four officers waiting to be hired with vacancies. So right now we have two officers in training, which is kind of low for us. Sometimes we have as many as six or seven or eight. So we don't have, uh, we've, we've pushed through a lot of officers in training, and I think you remember that last year uh, we overhired, mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. gave us a little head start at pushing a lot of officers through in training, so we have the benefit of having those officers in the field right now. Now, I'll tell you this, if our goal is to stay uh, at full strength, having nine vacancies is a lot of people waiting in line. So somewhere along the line here, we have to start getting people, you know, back in the pipeline, and, and that's where we're going. And the reason why that pipeline is empty again is because the academy was canceled in September. Mm -hmm. okay. That is really clear, and I really appreciate you taking the time to explain yeah. it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We better get going here. Okay. okay.
moving on to public works, we have a project engineer vacant. This position has been vacant, I think, close to two years, Chris. So we don't think that will have an impact. It does have our ability to get projects out. Um, we recently had a survey technician um, retire, and we're backfilling her now with just hourly staff. We still need to do the work, but not, not we're, we can do it with a lot less. So those are the annual savings. Um, we looked at our vector control and uh, this is under the, that's the underground uh, tank fund, leaking underground tanks. And um, we had some money, basically we didn't spend last year and so we think we can reduce that. This is probably more one time in that program by $120,000. Um, in the ICS program, uh, in facilities maintenance, we're recommending we hold a, a custodial position vacant. It's currently vacant. And we're holding a senior custodian position vacant until uh, the first of the year, and then we're going to probably need to fill it. And then in fleet maintenance, uh, we have a service rider who's going to be out for five months, and we these are the salary savings we'll get there. So all told, you'll see uh, this is where the recommended adjustments come from. Um, you can see in um, some departments we're not proposing any, and again, uh, in administrative services, um, we didn't see a way to do this without layoffs at this point. Uh, in the city attorney's office, the city attorney's next step was to um, reduce by one attorney's position, and that would have involved a layoff. Uh, in fire, at this point, we didn't feel we could make any additional reductions. Uh, and then in the mayor and council's um, area, we didn't see any areas. Uh, we've cut you pretty much down to the bone. Um, so again, you can see this was not just a, a pro rata, um, and we tried to be careful. The other thing I'll point out, because it's important with the police issue as well as the others, we're purposely not saying eliminate any positions at this point. We're saying hold positions vacant because we believe that we need to give you flexibility and there's going to be a future city council come January and give them the flexibility to deal with, with issues. And you'll, I think you'll... Part of this story is what we're going to tell you next Tuesday when we talk about our forecast for fiscal year 2011. In my opinion, this is getting us through. I, I think we have a real challenge to make things work you know, for the year that begins July 1st. And so we need to start talking about that um, because, because it, we don't want to, you're going to have to go deeper next fiscal year in order to solve the problem. And, um, you just need to keep your eye on the ball and recognize that that's coming up. And, uh, and that's our purpose next Tuesday when we talk about it. Um, and then again, then, this is a, a, an overview, again, of the balancing strategy, strategy we just went through. Um, some other issues I want to mention, um, the state budget impacts. You may recall that when we talked in June, that one of the things we talked about was the ability of mo using the streets measure G funds, that portion of the utility users tax that goes into the streets fund and possibly using that to solve some of our budgetary problems. And we had identified about close to a million dollars of capital projects that we could delay and then free that money up and move it into the general fund. <laughs> However, if you look at what's going on up in Sacramento, um, the gas tax money is still in play. Uh, the legislature, when they passed their budget balancing, put in some poison pills that if they lose a lawsuit, they're going to go back after this money. Uh, the um, uh, Daryl Steinberg, Senator Steinberg, has said that if um, if he's not successful in his lawsuit against the governor on some of the other cuts that the governor's made, that he would go after this. And so we didn't feel it was prudent to propose that you use those monies now if there's a potential for losing them. But we are holding back on some of those capital projects so that if we lose gas tax money mid-year, we don't have to make additional cuts in the gas tax area in the streets fund. So that's why that's not an option that we're proposing to you at this time. Um, and again, I, we've talked about this, but, I, but it's important. You know, we're doing the best we can on these revenue assumptions, um, uh, but we've, we think we've been conservative. Have we been conservative enough? It's very difficult to tell. Um, there's, we're on uncharted territory here, um, but we're doing the best we can, we, we, we can. And we'll be back again in two or three months if we find things get worse. 
but we did, for example, leave that $300,000 in the appropriated reserve to give you a little flexibility. Um, and, and, um, but, but clearly, if we had double-digit declines beyond what we're pro projecting, things could get worse. So that's the, the summary of our conclusion. I think we're looking for your initial thoughts. Um, as I said, some of these actions we can do administratively. Others will have to come back to you with implementing actions. With, with regards to fiscal year 2009, we will be coming back to you, I think it's in mid-October, with basically the, the, how we close the book for 2009. Um, and then we'll come back to you um, with some of these items that require council approval uh, on the 2010 issues. Okay. Okay. Um, I've been saying that we're really down to bare bones, but I, the thought just occurred to me we're really scraping the bones right now. It's really difficult, um, but but very interesting. And, and it's good that we aren't talking about any layoffs in the middle of the year. It's, it's so hard. It's hard anyway, but um, it's better, I think, to look at layoffs in the big picture if we can figure it out for next year. So I don't know. Um, Mr. Williams and then Mr. Horton. Well, first of all, I, I really appreciate the hard work. Yeah. I mean, this isn't easy stuff. And you know you're going to step on at least, um, uh, you know, a couple places where we're going to go, no, 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 no. Um, uh, and, but I do think that you've done a thorough enough job that it's given us a little bit of options and a little bit of breathing room in that um, we still have the uh, ace in the hole of, the um, Measure G funds, um, uh, assuming or hoping the state doesn't take that away. But as long as that is still out there, and look, we're already uh, a couple of months into the new fiscal year, um, we have a chance of having that as a fallback. And we all, you've also set aside the uh, half of about a little bit less than half of our appropriated reserve that we that we set up. And so I thought that would gives us a little bit of flexibility. Um, uh, you know, I still think it was. Um, a little bit of a mistake for us not to pursue some kind of revenue idea this year, especially um, uh, medicinal marijuana um, tax akin to what passed in Oakland by 80 percent. But, you know, look, we can't do everything right uh, all the time. Um, and um, there's we and we can adapt. I do think that um, it would be not a prudent course of action to reduce our sworn uh, uh, strength from 140. Um, I'd, I'd have to take a look at what what jobs were were civilianizing and and not, but I think the basic idea that we should be sending um, at least seven qualified applicants to the academy in January is really important. Um, we uh, that would prevent us from falling below the 140, and I think th that's what we need to to do especially at a time when, um, you know, Santa Barbara's, because of the high-profile um, gang violence we've experienced, uh, don't feel as safe. They may be as safe, and actually the statistics say they're safer, but they don't feel as safe. And, um, and, and we need to, to keep enough uh, sworn police officers in the field um, to protect their public safety. They, you know, the... Um, the other thing is that we always, because there's ups and downs in this labor market, if we don't keep a, a nice cushion, we can always face the situations where we're under strength no matter what we do or have to take drastic actions to prevent us from being under strength. So I think it's a good idea to, to send seven, seven to the academy so that we keep our sworn strength at 140. And I think that we can still meet these targets um, or at least uh, come $49,000 away from meeting these targets. And if that means we use, uh, you know, 49000 from uh, the, the appropriated, then uh, that's not the end of the world. Um, so, uh, and I think that there may be some other an answers to make up uh, eighty or $100,000 uh, more than what's, what's here in any case. Uh, so that would be my, 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 uh, my basic... Uh, um, comments you know I, I agree with the mayor that uh, it's going to be really tough to provide good city services if we have any more 
reductions, and I, I mean that for that for all departments. And I do think that that means that we need to continue to hone in on ongoing strategies uh, and and especially ongoing revenue strategies. And I I especially appreciate your responsiveness on regards to the underground and utility. Um, uh, funds, you know, that's that was a big issue for me. Uh, I think thus far, it's been a, a fund that's created a lot of ac more acrimony than it has public service, um, and so I think that we can use it for a better purpose uh, by 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 putting it to address some of these general fund issues. Okay, Mr. Horton. I think it's a good effort, and I. I and I greatly appreciate it. I think the presentation was clear. What really concerns me now is um, the next few months, in fact, the next year. Um, the uh, daily papers show uh, some positive signs when you look at the front page, but if you look behind the front page, the, um, the real signs of economic recovery, which for me would be uh, employment, for example, in the country, don't look particularly good, and it's conceivable for me anyway that some of the uh, TARP money is having the uh, planned effect and is um, impacting and we're getting a bounce, uh, and that's good, and that's what it was uh, supposed to be for. But the, the facts remain that the economy is still in pretty sad shape, and I think that uh, whatever we do, uh, you know, your uh, paragraph heading here says uncertain economic environment, and really all I'm trying to say is to reemphasize that point. Uh, you know, this, this is a good step, but from here forward, we don't know what's going to happen. And it, to me, it's, it's a 50-50 right now. It could just as easily continue sliding on down in terms of sales tax and TOT. I don't, I don't see, I'm not any, any particularly more optimistic now than I was three or four months ago. And if it does continue sliding on down, then whatever series of actions we take in the next few days has to um, start the planning for what could be a, a further decline in revenues. And when we talk about the, the layoff situation, I think all of us up here support that. We don't want to have that happen, but we certainly can't go much further without getting into um, reducing staff further and things like that. So I think there's a, it's a kind of a two-step process, which is to do the kind of uh, response that we need to do in the next few days by next week, basically. But that whatever we do, um, we don't preclude what, what I hope doesn't happen in, in, say, 90 days or 120 days from now. But the odds are about as good as it, we'll have to come back to this table then as, as it is now. But I do appreciate the work. Okay, Ms. Schneider. Thank you. And Thank you for this work, and I guess to all the department heads, I know this wasn't done just by two people over here. It was a, a bigger effort and um, important to do this. I I see the 3.5% decline. I think I just say the same kind of thing Roger just said uh, in a little different words, that we might have to come back depending on what's happening with the revenues, especially if we're so concerned with TOT declines being much worse than what we experienced last summer, and we were seeing that in Finance Committee and in full council recently. So uh, being as conservative as possible is important, and it's the combination of that and using so many one-time measures that just sets us up for fiscal year 11. We already had, can you remind me before today, in, in the current budget right now, how much of the balancing budget strategy included one-time measures? That's about $3 million. I think we've got it here. In the it was th yeah, it was somewhere in the presentation. So $3 million, and we're adding another 775000 Is that? I mean, the yeah, I think that's correct. Okay. So we're looking at for, for fiscal year 2011, which I'm sure you're going to talk about on Tuesday, we already have to figure out close to $4 million making up those one-time measures somehow. Okay. So that, I mean, that's looking into the future and just sort of setting that stage. Um, that's that's important to keep that in mind. Uh, one large issue, and then two very minor ones, and I have just have some questions moving forward. Um, 
the I, I have to agree with going to the academy for to go up to seven if we can, assuming of course these are qualified people we're sending. We're not just filling slots; they have to be qualified slots. Um, Part of my reason, too, is just looking at what just happened in September. We were hoping to bring put in a number of uh, positions into the academy in September, but through no fault of our own or, or just through outside circumstances, there is no academy. There's planning to be one in January, and it could happen that a future one could be six, nine months down the road, and we would have, you know, another four positions to wait for a much longer period of time if, if there's not another academy. So if there are seven that we could send and then st and do the appropriate analysis for the civilian civilianizing of those two other positions and if that works then those are two positions that we could use for the um, other duties that we typically think of when we think of a sworn police officer to me makes sense so it's not the full nine because of that uh, analysis I think is an important um, for all the issues that were, were raised earlier um, the one little itty bitty piece which sounds so minor compared to the big picture, mm -hmm. but I can tell I, I'm, I'm seeing the emails filling up my box right now, is this library 50 cent fee for the ju juvenile hold. And it, it's such a small number of $7,318. You don't have to come up at this point. Mm -hmm. But when this came up last spring, uh, part of the comments I heard from the general public, it wasn't the 50 cents, like we can't afford 50 cents. It was when, it, when you're looking at a library for juvenile books in particular, you're getting 20 at a time or a, a larger number at a time. That was some of the comments I received. So it sort of builds up. And the, there, there are issues related to this that I think it's different than the adult sections of the, of the library hold fee. And um, if it's an administrative function, that we're trying to deal with some red tape. I don't know if there's a better way to try to cut that red tape, but I do know that that I, I'd like to I'd like to at least figure out how we can communicate back to the people who were very concerned about it in the spring um, about why we're doing what we're doing. Because I think in the spring it, there was an oversight in some on the fee resolution schedule. It wasn't listed, and then it was on the list posted, and that created some problems. So I just want to make sure if we're going to go do this, that have they been notified? about this is there, you know, I don't want a, a repeat of what happened in the spring. And it would seem like, you know, a lot of uh, concerns from some some folks over $7,318 that maybe we could find somewhere else. It just seems like there's a small amount of money here that could um, be found somewhere if, it, if it's going to create that much of a problem. Again, this is such a small little piece of the puzzle based on almost $4 million of, of adjustments. But um, I think an important one just in terms of customer service back to people who use the library. Uh, and then the stipends, I'm, uh, you know, that's going to, I'm willing to look into this now, but I think we're going to, as we move into fiscal year 11, I would hate to lose qualified, real good professionals on boards and commissions that um, are such a key part of what we do as a city and as projects move through the process that, you know, if, if that does create a morale issue or something like that amongst some members, uh, that might have unintended consequences. So I want to just be careful about that because I know the boards and commissions were kind of mixed about um, whether they, they want to forego that or not. And again, in the grand scheme of things, it's something we can do, but I just want to highlight that a little bit because um, that was brought up earlier. But again, this is, uh, this is a tough, this is a very tough situation that we're in. Uh, I think we need to be nimble and uh, be flexible where we can. And, you know, it's unusual to go through budget hearings every quarter in, in the current year. But if that's what we have to do so we can minimize the impact to the residents um, as much as we can, that's our goal, and, uh, and minimize the services and uh, try to avoid layoffs when possible, but knowing it, that in the future there might be a situation where we, we have to relook at that uh, in certain areas. So um, thank you for this, and I look forward to Tuesday. Okay, Grant. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I have something else. Thank you, uh, Mr. Samario and, and Mr. Armstrong. We've, uh, I, I, I appreciate today's report. It was uh, uh, really concise and clear and easy to understand. Um, at least I, I feel like I've got my hands on what you've given us here so far. Uh, my, uh, and I think the approach that you're taking is one that um, is workable and uh, deals with the current situation as you've assessed it really well. Uh, I, I tend to agree with the um, uh, suggestions, which sort of messes it up a little bit here, but about seven, sending seven to the academy if we can have that opportunity. And if it's not 
you know, over, overwhelmingly burdensome for our staff because um, one of the things that I think uh, those of us who are out and about in the community know is that the, um, uh, the work that we're able to do at that beat coordinator level at the, at the point of contact with our, our police department and the community at large can be so um, uh, preventative in its very nature. I mean, it gets and, 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 and builds resilience in the neighborhoods that would avoid very costly problems later on. So that may be true elsewhere in the organization, but certainly at that point, um, uh, I, I'm just so concerned that we're going to get to some place where we begin to cut beyond where we can deliver the kind of uh, qualitative uh, relational relation building kind of things that are really important but in any case um, I don't want to get too far behind we've missed the one Academy and that's a that's a concern and um, it'll it wouldn't take much attrition for us to be in a spot and I take the deputy chief's uh, comments to heart with that um, so just in general um, one of the things that I well I wanted to ask a question the question is um, uh, and mr. Armstrong maybe you're the one to, to ask it of to what degree, when the department heads are working on the recommendations to you, uh, for you to, to sift out and sort out, to what degree are they inquiring deeper into the organization uh, to the people who are actually um, doing the work to ask them for what they see as uh, possible strategies or opportunities that can be effective that would uh, also not harm their ability to deliver what we on the policy board, if you will, have, uh, expect of them and, and hope. I mean, have we gone, how deep in the organization do we go when we prepare for like today's meeting or the ones that are coming up? And next, next Tuesday when we give their presentation, one of the things that's going to be different is, is that I'm going to ask each department head to talk about what they're looking at for next fiscal year. And so you'll be able to, I guess, talk with them a little more directly. And I, I think what I would say is, is that it, this current round that we've done, we've put this together relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think that in most cases the departments would tell you that they pretty much did this quickly to, be, to try and respond quickly. But the things that are on this list in many cases are items that they have been discussing with their staffs for the last probably nine months because these are the things that were already on the list that we had already looked at. The mm -hmm. only difference is, is that as I said, really at the start is we're taking advantage of vacancies where they've occurred in some cases and then moving people around and because we're trying to avoid layoffs. Um, but I think there's a balance between trying to get your staff um, involved in creating solutions and creating paranoia in the organization. And I think each department has to balance that out because in some cases by seeking information, and, and you'll know when you get back to your to your offices, you'll see that I sent an email out today. It went out probably at exactly 1.30 that pretty much summarized for all of the employees what we were going to be talking about mm -hmm. today. I wanted to get it to them so they don't read about this in the newspaper, but they also have the information about what we were talking about today. But there's a balance between how far do you go down and then also creating undue fear in the organization. And, and each department has to balance that differently and what their communications are. And I think you will have an opportunity next week to talk. Because I've asked the department heads to talk not about specific positions, but say if things, based upon what we know now and if things get worse, here's the kinds of things we're looking at in order to, to try and deliver you a balanced budget for next year. And so that's the purpose of next week. You know, I think you'll have a chance for that interchange. Okay, I, 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 good, I appreciate that. The, um, done one way, this kind of a uh, balancing um, act that we're doing can, can generate fear in, a, in an organization, and we can understand that because we're all really struggling right now with our own personal finances, let alone with um, the big organization. Um, I, I have a sense that if we do it the right way, I don't know, I don't know it really depends on the relationship each of the department heads has with their teams, but in, done in a certain way, there may very well be a, a, um, a willingness on behalf of literally the, the city's family of, of employees to, to work together in a, in a way that maybe we haven't even gotten to yet. We've done phenomenal things over the past. I mean, we all have to agree. There's, you know, look how many millions of dollars that we've trimmed out to try to really adjust to this, and it's just, it's taken a team effort. And um, I, I, I have a sense if we're going to go any further and be effective in it, we better be... Um, uh, working from the ground up in our strategy so that we have the best 
uh, information from those who are going to be the ones delivering the, the services and, and, and the work product. And, and so this goes to my last question, which is kind of maybe a little extreme, but um, Mr. Samario, how, so how far down does this take us in terms of our, um, uh, what we would consider our operating budget then with these changes here for the fiscal year that we're talking about here? A hundred and five million, is that right? Or I, where's the oh. table here? Madam Mayor, yes, members of council, are you referring to a specific table? Yeah, I'm looking at uh, with a ta uh, table. I'm going back to the beginning uh, ones, past the bar graphs, and where you were starting to show us the uh, projected versus the actual. And I'm trying to find the one that actually had sort of a bottom line number that we were working with. We had uh, originally been talking about 110 million dollars operating. Um, we're down now 104, 105, something like that. Is that? Maybe you yeah, can. just a quick answer. You know, for this year, the measures that we're, we're proposing aren't making any adjustments to expenditures for the most part. They're just looking at um, using some one-time measures um, and holding vacancies, you know, holding positions vacant. Um, so the budget's yeah. going to go from about $104 million maybe to $102 million. But from a budgetary perspective, you know, we're not sure what it's going to be, but it's, I would say a couple million dollars below what it is today. Okay. Well, and just to put that in perspective, uh, the adopted budget for 2009 was, as I recall, $108 million. Your adopted budget now is 104 This pretty much gets you to about 102 in that. And, and, and then when you recognize that during that two-year period, we've had um, a lot of costs go up in terms of MOUs um, mm -hmm. that, that caused salary and benefits to go up. So it's a, that's how you get the kinds of cuts we've had to make. And then that, that, those are real dollar impacts on the budget. Yeah, because it's going in both directions at once. Okay, good. So um, so this is this is where I'm going with that. To, to, to the largest degree, it appears that what we've been doing is we've been trying very hard to make cuts that have the least impact on the public as possible and to do it and, and keep the organization whole and also keep vital staff resources that it would cost a great deal to retrain if we had to rehire at some point. So we're keeping our personnel and the organization whole. Um, at what point do we look at it from the other end? I mean, at, let's just say we became a brand new city this year and we were trying to put this thing together, and we looked at what our organization would look like and how we could deliver services our, our community needs um, for, uh, you know, within whatever revenues we might think we might get. But, like, actually, it's almost a restructuring kind of conversation where we really begin to look at it from, okay, say we've got $95 million or 90 or 100 or some number, and then we try to work back, work into that from, from the other way. Um, it's, it's a major you know, question to ask, but what we're doing is we're getting backed into a corner because the circumstances keep unfolding in front of us and we're always getting more dire you know, news. Um, is there a way for us to leap ahead a bit and be not just preparing for the next round of bad news, but to actually look at the organization and see, well, let's, 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 let's figure a couple years from now. We're going to be a smaller, leaner organization. We know it and um, maybe in a proactive way begin to plan for that as opposed to be in sort of a reactive mode. So it's a, it's a different, maybe it's a different approach, maybe not. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what we're doing, but I'd really like to just have a little bit of that conversation because at this point, every three months, we're probably going to keep coming back and finding ourselves pushed back a little tighter, a little tighter, a little tighter. Isn't there any way for us to get a proactive relationship with this and create what we want to see as a city organization a year or two from now that would be intentionally leaner and um, and uh, and maybe much more efficient, or is that too, is that just too big of a question to try to take on? You know, to, when we're trying to just deal with a three month change from the recently adopted you know, budget. I guess I would say, in theory, I would like to do something like that, but I guess I, we, I think we have to deal with the situation we exist in. Um, one, you guys, the, you know, council members are elected, um, and you have constituencies. We have labor associations out there that are all special interest. Um, if, if, if I were to come to you, if you said create the perfect organization and, and what would it look like and, you know, and most efficient, um, you know, one, there's the community priorities. Um, there's the contracting out for services. Do we contract out more work? There's a whole series of issues that each one in itself could be very, very controversial and could create a lot of angst. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Um, and in my experience is, is that in most cases, you just create so many folks that are opposing it that you're not going to get any place, and you just create a lot of dissension in the organization. I can tell you, though, at the micro level and at the program level, that the departments are looking at things like, do we need all of this? You know, and Nancy will I, will, I think, will address this next week. Do we need all of the community buildings that we have, and do we need to get out of certain facilities or certain businesses? That we need to look at it program by program, department by department, I think you'll be more effective that way in actually getting the results you need than trying to blow up the boxes. As much as I like doing that kind of stuff theoretically, I, I just think it would probably be counterproductive, um, you know, unless you're really prepared to, you know, roll up your sleeves and also recognize that you might have this room filled with a bunch of issues one at a time, some of which you probably really don't want to deal with. And I'm, I'm just being candid with you. I, um, I, I think that would probably be counterproductive. I don't like the muddling through that we're doing because it's a lot of that. But eventually, I think you're going to get a leaner organization, and it will reflect community priorities. And we will give you some issues you don't want to hear about. We're going to tell you things, I think, next week and with the budget that we propose to you next year that are going to be controversial enough that you'll have to deal with. But it's probably you can take it in, in more, I guess, um, um, you know, in chunks that you can deal with rather than trying to look at the whole organization. Thanks for indulging me on that. I just I just wanted to at least just ask it out loud instead of just have it stuck in my head rolling around. And we get asked by constituents these kinds of questions all the time. What's reassuring about your answer to me, and I don't know about for the rest of the council, but is that each of our department heads and their organizations are, are making a very serious effort to uh, ensure that what they're doing and the way they're doing it is as efficient as absolutely possible. And, and, and as long as I have that assurance, when we, we see them come back here at this next meeting, that, that goes a long way towards answering my constituents when they come up and say, you know, how, what are you guys doing over there, you know? So, um, and I appreciate, and I, I'm, in advance, I want to appreciate each of the department heads and their teams for preparing themselves for this very difficult round of discussions. And, uh, and thank you in advance for really taking a hard look at each of these things. Thank you very, very much. Okay, Ms. Falcone. Pardon? Ms. Falcone, didn't you say? Thank you. Um, in reality, to give you credit, Jim, you have been trying over the last eight years that I've been here uh, to make the organization more efficient and leaner and meaner and trying to build efficiencies and combining jobs or combining uh, certain tasks and so forth. To, so to your credit, you have been doing this for a very long time in terms of this organization and trying to really bring it into uh, the leaner and meaner, uh, more efficient organization so so to your credit and and these things take time and change is very difficult and so it has taken a while to must things up and then get people comfortable with that and then muss it up again and get people comfortable with that. But uh, we're, we're very different than we were uh, when you first got here or when I first got here. Uh, that being said, um, I, I do think that there's there is there is more to do in terms of getting out a certain business. I mean, you don't blow up the entire organization. That doesn't make any sense. But looking at certain things, should we be getting out of certain businesses? Should we really be changing certain structures of how things are managed, uh, going more regionally on some aspects? I think you, you would uh, do well to look at that in, in a variety of different ways. And we've talked about that, and I've talked about it on the record, too. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that it's going to get much uglier before it starts turning around and getting prettier. And uh, you will be back here l trying to dig out of a four to five million dollar hole, really, that has been patched with uh, various sort of monies from here, there, and yon. But it will come back to roost as it has in the st at the state level. That being said, um, I appreciate hearing that uh, there is a sentiment to send more than the five uh, to the Academy this time in January. I would submit that we send all nine because that's the, that's the number we need to stay at strength that the community seems to be able to be handled by. I mean, 140 is a number that we picked because it is sufficient is it optimal? No. The number is more in the 150 range because that's what was really functioning at full capacity 
when we had the money and we had the bodies and things were good back in 99-2000. Uh, since then, it's been all sort of quite rocky. and It's gotten much worse than it is now. But I submit you don't want to go back there. You really, really don't under any circumstances because that's the front line of where people begin to get their safety level and confidence in the community and in the governing of, of the organization. So I would submit that you increase it, that we all increase it to the nine, at least to background, to see whether or not you can get out of 300 or 30 or 40 backgrounds, nine capable folks that we would want on our force. Now, I'm not sure I buy into the fuzzy math of the two being um, to returned over to patrol, but uh, if that were true, it hasn't happened yet. So instead of hedging on the side of, of leaner, why don't we hedge on the side of what we need? And we, always, and we don't always have to send those folks if people decide to civilianize certain, certain positions because uh, I'm not sure that's a great idea and that it actually does equate to two more on patrol. I'm not, I'm not buying that yet. It may be, but I'm not buying it yet. Um, so I would say that we go ahead and, and background enough to get nine, and then we take it from there because, as somebody said, we have fallen behind in the past, and with the Academy not happening this last time, we're falling behind again, and I would submit... Y'all don't want to go back there, those of you who are staying. So um, that's my suggestion. Otherwise, I think you've done a fantastic job. I really appreciate the work that, that everybody has done because cutting and changing and restructuring is really, really difficult. And you've got human bodies on the line here. Um, and nobody likes doing it. But, you know, if you can't get there by will, you get there by force. So uh, we, will, we will get there this time. And, I, I, I really don't think you want to start playing around with the numbers at this point. We're already fudging around with it enough. I suggest you get real real about it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Jim, was it your idea that we would go into more detail about the actual impacts of these on a department-by-department department basis the next time around? No, I, if, if you've got specific I have some questions, questions yes. I, that's why the department Great, excellent. Here, okay. First, for the I see we have library folks here. Uh, could you just give me a, a sort of a brief rundown on the expected impact of holding these three positions open? Irene Macias, Library Director. Um, early in this fiscal year, January 1st through Jan uh, July 1st through J July 5th, we had three um, resignations or retirements. Um, it has stretched the staff. Um, we're still open seven days a week, but there are some services that um, are not being provided at the same level or perhaps not as quickly as possible. Our own airport director, who I believe is in, in the building, um, was using the library and noticed that um, you may not be helped as quickly as you have been in the past. So there is an impact. We have very dedicated staff. They really value customer service. Um, and so we are holding the line, but it is getting more difficult, particularly in light of the busyness of the library. We've had more usage recently, and uh, I will refer um, to the 50 cent fee. Um, that really wasn't for the revenue. It was really to address this new workload that has been imposed due to the fact of this. Um, we do belong to the Black Gold uh, Regional Cooperative. We cooperate with Ventura County and San Luis Obispo County share all our materials up and down the coast. That 50 cent fee is to bring something either from another library or um, to notify you that it's here if it's currently checked out. So what happens now is that each time that um, a juvenile hold gets placed, uh, the staff have to go in and manually waive that fine so that the person doesn't incur the fine. 
uh, or the fee. So um, it's strictly a workload issue. Um, there are about 19,000 juvenile holds placed um, in a year. So multiply that. So you're saying that basically the service impact of continuing these positions open is increased time on customer response. Is that it? Mm -hmm. For the most part, yes. Okay. Um, and you also mentioned that you've seen an increased usage in the library. Could you give me a rough idea of what that's been over what period? Just rough. doesn't have to be exact. Yeah. In the last year, um, our usage in our entire system has increased about 7 or 8 percent in terms of materials checked out. Um, we have um, probably closer to 10 percent increase in the number of people that are coming into the library. A lot of them are, are actually first-time users or return users who haven't used our service in a long time. They're coming for, uh, you know, they've canceled their cable uh, service at home, so they're using our uh, wireless internet service. They have um, lost their jobs and find out that they have to apply for jobs online, so they come to the library to use the computers. We just have a real influx of people using the library because of the inc economic times. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and also some, some questions for community development. If you have a... While Paul's coming up, I just wanted to say that the biggest... Um, the biggest impact of the 50 cent on the juvenile library books is for people who are doing some in-home teaching because they try to hold those sure. books for the juvenile, for the kids, and we hadn't sure. said that. And so those are the people that we heard from before. So I don't know how many there are out there, though it's interesting that we have 19,000 books held each year. So, uh, But we'll see, and, and maybe there's another, uh, I don't know maybe a fund that they can use. I'm not sure. So, Okay, okay community Mr. Casey, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just had a sort of a general question about uh, given the recession and given I would assume a decrease in, in construction and permitting, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, maybe that's balanced by the, by the fire recovery. I have no idea. But could you give me an idea, uh, again, just in very rough terms, because I didn't ask you to prepare for this, but give me just a rough idea of, of what the workload in community development has been like over, say, the past six months, how that compares to earlier times. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Francisco, Paul Casey, Community Development Director. You're right. I think as we acknowledged in our budget presentation that we have seen a reduction in our workload in certain sections of the department. Uh, in building and safety, starting last fall, we saw a slowdown in plan checks coming in and a commiserated uh, drop in revenue about 15 to 20 percent drop in revenue. It's plateaued since then. It's actually stayed pretty steady in the summer. It's picked up a little bit. Uh, on the planning on the development review side, we've seen a similar slowdown in new applications. We still have a number of applications that we're still working on controversial projects that just take time to get through, but you're certainly not seeing as many new uh, of the mixed use and complicated projects coming in the door at this point. And so we made a reduction of about 10 staff positions in this last fiscal year. In a lot of ways, those were reflective in those areas where we saw the slowdown, either through vacancies or people getting jobs in other departments or we contracted with Public Works uh, for some staff work to kind of buy some time, see what the future development activity is going to be like. Uh, but next fiscal year, I'll talk about on Tuesday, we're probably going a little deeper in that area as well. Some areas where we haven't seen a slowdown, though, would be code enforcement. Uh, oftentimes you see more code enforcement issues in this type of economy sure. as well as zoning enforcement. And so there are kind of certain pockets where you don't see as big of a slowdown. Uh, so it's kind of a mixed bag. Is there any possibility, and maybe you've already done this, of shifting resources towards enforcement internally? We've tried to do that. Uh, we've looked at that. Uh, we haven't been able to shift resources to enforcement, but we've been trying to protect as much enforcement as we can while still making pretty dramatic reductions in the overall budget. And so the focus has been on the building and safety side and to some extent on the development review side. Uh, but just as you reduce kind of the cross-pollination of our planners and what they work, you just do see a general impact even on enforcement to some extent, especially because some of the staff that got transferred or got other jobs came from the enforcement section. So then you are transferring people over to support enforcement, but you have to train them up and they need to get skilled in that area because it's kind of a unique area. Okay. And so just going back to my first question, so would you say – just ballpark that you've seen something on the order of a 15% reduction in new 
projects and yes okay and so in those areas that deal with the new projects okay correct okay very good thank you very much yep. and finally just a couple questions for the uh, police department again So, Deputy Chief, is it my understanding that this idea of civilianizing the training position and the special events coordinator, that, that those ideas are still being studied, or, or is this a done deal? It is not a done deal. It's an idea that we've looked at over the years. Um, the attractive side is we feel we can be more efficient uh, because we don't have highly paid sworn positions doing essentially administrative work. The negative side is we reduce the officer strength by two officers, and whatever flexibility we have, we lose that capacity. So we've kind of toyed back and forth with this, and generally speaking, most police administrators like more cops, not less cops. So I fall into that category too, I admit it. Um, but at the same time, when I'm looking at ways of achieving efficiency in the organization as a city, uh, this is something that I'm forced to consider. and and, and perhaps recommend but right now we're just looking at it okay and so I'm probably missing something really basic here but if if we have let's let's say that we do civilianize the, the two positions we're talking about right now those are currently held by sworn officers that's correct we are seven soon to be nine officers short of full strength yes so so we're at 100, and, or we're going to be soon at 131 instead of 140. In, in field strength, In yes, field strength. Action, yeah. So if those two officers are freed from having to do duties that could be done by a civilian, can't we change it to one, from 131 to 133 actually deployed? What would happen is our total uh, authorized strength would go from 140 to 138, and therefore we would lose two vacancies. So instead of having nine vacancies, since we are contracting by two, we would have seven vacancies. But the number of officers who are assigned to field strength would remain the same since the two we are losing aren't coming from field strength anyway. But w are you saying that we're compelled to get rid of these officers? No, but by the officer is staffed, or the deployment cost is about $120,000 for salary and benefits. We would realize that savings of 120, and then we would backfill with the non-sworn at about 160. So you would save, you know, $65,000 per position. Well, I guess, and maybe, Mr. Armstrong, you look like you're ready to jump in. What I'm really trying to understand here is we have a shortage of sworn officers right now, and it seems to me a no-brainer that if we can move sworn officers out of a position that a civilian can do just as well, that we should be doing that and that it helps us solve a problem. So, so what, am I, what am I missing here? I, I don't think you're missing anything. I think, I think the question is, is if, if, if we found it was totally feasible to make this change, then what you would do is you would have two more non-sworn positions in the department mm -hmm. that would be doing those two activities, and you would have two less sworn positions. The two incumbents that are, no, or that are in those positions right now would go into more traditional police work, patrol detectives. Okay. So you'd have no impact on the mm -hmm. on-street folks. But, you, but I'll be honest, you would be at 138 sworn, not 140 sworn, right. and you'd be at two more non-sworn, and you, we think you'd save $175,000 a year. Okay. But we can still have a goal of having 140 sworn or whatever we want. That's just... Yeah. We're, we're talking about we're talking yeah. about org chart changes, not reality yeah, but, uh, changes. But just to be clear, if you mm -hmm. stayed at 140 and you funded the 140 and you added two civilian spots, your costs would go up, not down. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and the other question, um, I guess this is this is not really for today, but but maybe for the next session. One thing that I would be very interested in seeing in a council agenda report uh, is a description of the administrative side of the PD what the positions are, what the functions are, is it a sworn or a civilian holding that position, just for us to get a, an idea of, of what that situation is and are there any other opportunities, because from my point of view, uh, civilianizing positions that can be civilianized uh, is a good thing. Yeah. That's something that we want to do. And if, if, we, can, um, if we can liberate sworn officers 
for the kind of work that only they can do, that's that's a, a real achievement. So that, that that's something that I would I would like to see next time around. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. There's another uh, okay. table that I'd like to see for next week, which, which I've uh, seen before in some fashion or another. But uh, back to the overall efficiency of the city. Uh, since we've been um, on council, some of us at least, we've we com converted some temporary positions to full time, which was our goal. But if I if you stabilize that and you look over time, it seems to me that our actual um, working FTE is actually at the level it was several years back, and and uh, this helps to answer the question that many people have asked me: Are you doing anything to actually make the the city more efficient? And the table that I've seen does answer that, but I haven't seen it in the last few weeks. But I think now it's becoming relevant, and if you can bring that uh, Tuesday, uh, it would be uh, helpful for me at least. And what that is is the table over the past, is it five years? I'm trying to picture the table in my mind of how many FTEs we have. But also we had uh, something like 800 at one point temporary workers who are no longer, what, we're down to 200 or something like that? Is that right? No, it's not I'm quite that. Not quite that dramatic. They're hourly, but, no. but when you look at that's part of the problem when you do the just a classic you yeah. know, position control you have, comparison yeah. is that we we did make um, oh, probably about five years ago we yeah. converted I think around thirty hourly employees who in most cases were working you know fifteen hundred, two thousand hours, we converted those to full time positions. Right. Primarily in parks and recreation. I think okay. there were a couple in downtown parking, maybe a couple in the waterfront. That then when you look at those departments it looks like they've gained positions, but in terms of actually hours of people doing the work, it went down, down because yeah. the cost per unit went up. And um but we'll we'll try and get you that information and then we may have to because it's a relatively short period of time just give you a an explanation of what we think has affected some of the more significant changes there. That's good. Okay. Um, Doss. So just so that we we don't get too um, into the minutia, I, I, w I just want to make sort of my position, and I think where we should be going with the PD clear, you know, um, I said seven because I also hope that, you know, we might be able to actually get lateral, lateral transfers, which is our always – more valuable when we have veteran officers. But I think, to me, I'm not yet convinced that we want to reduce or civilianize those positions. And until you convince us that we should civilianize those positions, to me, it's the mandate that we've given you to maintain 140 sworn police officers. And I can't, I, I mean, I just want to remind you how many times we've said that, um, because that is what the people of this city are asking us to demand, and I think we need to continue to demand that. And um, uh, the until we see a, an appreciable um, uh, sort of tipping point in our efforts, particularly against youth violence, I think that's appropriate. Uh, so uh, I just hope that we do everything we can to maintain that 140. If we do everything we can to maintain that 140, we're still going to see um, most of the of the savings that you're asking for uh, from the PD. So I just hope that 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 we can rely uh, off of the um, really the the mandate that we've put forward in the past that we are going to do everything we can to keep as close to 140 sworn police officers as we can at any given time. And I think that was uh, something that we voted on a while ago. But I think it's, if, just from my point of view, I think it's really important that we listen to the chief and to the deputy chief about how many um, to put into the academy because they're the ones that know. Um, it makes a difference in your first year on the street, on patrol. Um, they have to have uh, people right next to them and all that, which is very important. And um, and we also have to do be yeah, you know, psychological tests and everything too on on these people. So um, I'm going to be relying heavily on on their uh, points of view. I think that's very important. So I also wanted I just wanted to say something about the employees because we haven't said anything yet. I think the spree de corps in the in, uh, among our employees is very good right now, even though the recession is very bad right now. <laughs> it's 
kind of amazing. And so I wanted to compliment you on that because I think I've had a lot of employees stop me and say, I ask them how they're doing, and they say, you know, they're really grateful to have a job. And uh, they don't mind the furloughs. They know they're losing money. Uh, in, uh, their, their pay has gone down, but uh, they're really grateful to have a job, and they really have that sense of family, uh, sense of, of um, the sense of the organization, and I think that's really wonderful. But they seem to really understand the situ situation, and I, I just wanted to give Mr. Armstrong some kudos. I can't give them yet, although I could give some to you too, because you just started this job. But, uh, but I think it's very good that when people, it, it's a complicated situation. We've never seen anything like this before, but uh, people seem to understand and seem to accept it and seem to still have that good esprit de corps. And I'm, I'm grateful, and I hope in the next year we can still have that. It's, it's really tough times out here, so. Okay, anything else? Yes. Yes, Mr. Francisco. Uh, I just wanted to speak to uh, Mr. Williams' point about the, the number of sworn officers. Of course, we want to keep at least 140. We may want more sworn officers. Uh, but the important point to keep in mind is that when the people of this city are thinking about the police force, they're not thinking so much about the people who are doing administrative work, though, of course, that's vital. Um, when they think of the police, they're thinking about detectives. Right officers out on the street. That's what they're thinking about. That's what the police force is to them. And so from my point of view, if there is a sworn officer functioning, for instance, as the special events coordinator, and we can find a civilian to do that job, that is a good idea. And if that means that instead of, of reducing the number of sworn positions to balance the budget, we have to increase it, that's something we need to look at. Because the police department is probably our single most important function as a city. Um, so just because you have 140 sworn officers, if, and I don't know what the number is, but if 15 of them are doing non-patrol and non-investigative work, then as far as the public is concerned, our sworn officer uh, total is 125. So that's, that's all I want to keep in mind, that we, we're, we're talking about who are the effective people doing investigative work and patrol. So feet on the street. Exactly. Okay. okay. And boots on the ground or whatever all those are, <laughs> all those sayings. Anyway, so I think that's it. Is there anything else you want from us? No, I think that's, okay. you know, yeah. the, but there is, a, there is a difference. When you have the, the sworn police officers, look, you know, I, I occasionally I call, I, I hear what you're saying. There's a lot of work that's being done that would not necessarily be ideally performed by a sworn police officer. I call up some officers and I'm, you know, and it's not them calling me, so it's, I know it's not staged, and they're like going on a toilet paper run out to Costco or, or you know, dealing with a, a, a broken window of a patrol officer, so I, of, of a patrol car. So I know there's some of that going on. Um, but even if you have some folks operating in a civilian capacity in the department, when there's an emergency, they go onto the street. So there is, there is, there is a, a, a just a, an, an inherent advantage, and all I'm saying is we need to be looking at that very carefully. Okay. okay. Did we have anything else? No? We're going to adjourn then until, is it Tuesday? I've forgotten. It is Tuesday. Thank you. On the 7th. Thank you.